We are very honored tonight to have uh, the two leading owners of the Washington Commanders here, um, Josh Harris and Mitch Rails. And we're going to talk about the uh, talk about the team. And as I said at a dinner we had, uh, our long civic nightmare is over, right? OK, so um, let me just introduce them for those who don't know them. And I'll start with Josh. Josh, as you probably all know, um, is a native of the area. He went to Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. Then he went to Wharton, graduated summa cum laude. He worked at Drexel, went to Harvard Business School, graduated as a Baker Scholar, which is top 5% of your class. Uh, briefly went to Blackstone and then went to help start Apollo. And he's been there for many years, but while he's been there, he's also had an, ex an effort to buy some sports teams. And with some partners, he bought the Philadelphia 76ers, the New Jersey Devils, the Crystal Palace team in- Eagles, in Eagles, Eagles. In, in, London. in London. In London, yeah. in London. And, um, so he's got a lot of background in sports. He was himself an athlete, and he uh, wrestled at Bethesda Chevy Chase and wrestled at University of Pennsylvania. Um, NCAA champion or not yet? <laughs> OK. No. Um, we have another athlete here, uh, Mitch. Mitch went to Walt Whitman High School, where he was captain of the football team and also captain of the baseball team. Um, he didn't play uh, college football, but he went to uh, Miami University in Ohio and came back uh, afterwards and began a business with his brother Steve. That business, uh, known as Danaher, it's not a well-publicized business because while it's based in Washington, D.C., if you go to their offices, it doesn't even have their name on it. He's very low-key. But just to think about this, they started this company in 1984, and the market, capital, market capitalization of the company has gone up since 1984 by 159,000%. 159,000%. That's at a compounded <laughs> annual rate of 22%. So if you put your money in the stock market, the S&P 500 since 1984 has gone up on average about 10%. They've more than doubled that, and that's not bad. So. Uh, Mitch is himself also interested in art, and he's built Glenstone, which I guess is the largest privately owned uh, art museum uh, in, uh, in the United States, and it's a spectacular facility out in Potomac. Mitch is uh, also the president of the National Gallery of Art, uh, among other things. And uh, both of them have been pretty successful, and I guess they came together to help buy this team and restore <laughs> the ownership to some, something everybody can be proud of. So let's dig into it. Um, you won the first three preseason games. Do you think that's a message from God that, that, do you think that's a message from God that maybe he's happy with the ownership change or not? Yeah, so since you asked me to lab, I'll say yeah. Okay. I think he is happy. All right, and so um, now uh, the trick is to not only win the regular season games, and is the first game which is coming up on Sunday, is it sold out? It is sold out. Third. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Washington. Thank you, DMV. And the second game is that sold out yet? <laughs> it's getting. It's very close. You got to get them. Right. Get them quick. So very I think close. It's available. Okay. So, what about the stadium itself? Um, the stadium was built many years ago, and um, are you thinking about a new stadium? Uh, where would you put it? Is it going to have a dome and things like that? So, <laughs> so right now, <laughs> just dive right in. Um, <clears throat> right now, we're really focused on, um, you know, kind of the opening game, the season. Like, how do we win football games? So that's like our biggest. We need to win a bunch of football games for the city of Washington. And so getting up to speed with uh, Ron and his group. Um, and, and we're also focused on the existing stadium, right, needed some work. Uh, you know, a lot of things needed work. There wasn't a, a good sound system. Some of the chairs were broken. The bathrooms, uh, the ingress and egress, the food. So what we're trying to do is uh, welcome everyone into a, a changed house. Like we all, we all view it as our house. And you're coming to visit us. You're our honored visitors. <clears throat> so we're working literally daily calls, like morning, noon, and night. Uh, Mark and I sitting there. He's you know helping and leading the charge. And we're and we're sitting there trying to make it better. Right. Uh, and, then we're, and then we're out in the community. We're having lots of events to get people excited. Because when you talk to the players, 
Um, they really long for a packed stadium. They want Washington to come and support them. So um, those are the things we're focused on right now. And you know, and then over time, obviously, we're not. Uh, we 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 realize we're playing playing an older stadium. Uh, there's a lot of things that newer stadiums bring that older stadiums don't bring, and so we're gonna we're looking hard at that. But that's gonna take some time. So right now, we're really focused on these three things. Okay. So you were refer referring to Mark Ein. Mark Ein is there for those who don't know. Mark uh, went to uh, Wharton with you, and Harvard Business School also is in the third grade. The elementary school, yeah. Elementary school. And um, Mark is also the person who's bringing uh, professional tennis to uh, Washington, has done that, and he's also a, a limited partner in your yes. team. Okay. Yes, yes. So here's a question, Mitch, for you. You're a really, obviously a smart businessman. The market capitalization of your company is going up by more than any other company that's a publicly traded company since 1984. I think Apple was number two, and Berkshire Hathaway is number three. You're ahead of them. So you're a very smart guy, but you've now paid the highest price in the history of civilized world for a football team. Why would a smart businessman want to pay the highest price anybody's ever paid? Couldn't you pay a lower price? He paid it, not me. <laughs> I, I, you know, so this is an iconic asset that belongs to the people of the Washington metropolitan area, or the DMV as we call it. We are the custodians and stewards of this once iconic franchise that we have to restore. And sometimes you have to do what you have to do to take matters into your own hands. And I think that's the way we looked at it. Well, let's talk about how the two of you came to do this. Um, right. Uh, Mitch, had you um, ever been interested in buying a sports team before? Uh, I had zero interest in buying a sports team until I got to know this guy a little <clears> bit. <throat> and I think what Josh and I really felt down deep in our hearts, and, and I mean this when I say it, we are the custodians and stewards of this franchise, hopefully for the rest of our lives. And we have to build it one block at a time from the bottom up, and, and bring it back to the life that it once was. And what's amazing about this process is the fans are already helping us figure this out. They're, they're coming back in spades right so, now, and it's awesome to see. Now, Mitch, you've obviously been successful in business, but once you bought this team, did people from high school started calling you up and saying, hey, I knew you'll be successful, and you hear from your old friends from grade school or something? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to be out in Denver. Can I have a lift out and a lift back? You know, you're getting a lot of that right now. So um, how did the two of you come together? Um, you, you didn't really know each other before, did you? We, we knew each other. So when I um, left Apollo, which was uh, several years ago, and um, I, went and I went and talked to people that I thought would give me great advice. And uh, you know, I, my friend Mark um, said, why don't you talk to uh, Mitch? I had met him, incredibly successful business person. And so, we talked about uh, you know how to spend you know the next years you know wh what's important in life like what matters, and so um, you know obviously um, this matters right and like how could how can you when you're blessed to be uh, successful um, and uh, you know God has um, smiled at you you know you sort of think about what do you want to do next and for me it's about impact like how do you impact and so that's how we met and uh, we struck up a friendship and. Um, the next thing you know, we were, um, you know, we, we read about uh, the commanders possibly being for sale, and uh, all of us, I was starting, uh, Mitch was busy renting Donna here. Uh, I was uh, starting an investment firm, which has been amazing and great, and, and it was not a great time for either of us, but both of us said, this is too important to ignore. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta jump in and try to figure this out. So that's how we met, and okay. since then, we spent an awful lot of time together. Okay, so um, let me ask you this. Um, how did the sales process work? Did you, um, if Bank of America was, I guess, representing uh, yep. the owner, uh, won't mention his name, but the owner, and um, you know, suppose you paid a lower price. Suppose you say, look, no team has ever been paid, but I think the highest price before for an NFL team was like close to five billion. Why didn't you just pay 5.1 or 5.2 billion? Look, in every transaction, you know, there's a buyer and there's a seller, right? And there's a, a process that, uh, go, that you go through. And there were other people around. I mean, one, one individual in particular that owns a, a newspaper that we're really fond of here in the city. 
uh, was, was rumored to be around. And so, um, and so, so this was the price that we arrived at. And truthfully, like, we're, both Mitch and I are doing this um, to win championships, to steward this franchise, and to really engage and make the DMV proud of what we're doing. But I also think that it's worth saying that the um, NFL is uh, the biggest league in the world. Uh, 90, believe it or not, 92 of the top 100 shows in the NFL uh, you know, that America watches are NFL football games. Washington, I mean, the mayor said it best. There is no other city like Washington. Washington is Washington. Uh, the commanders for many years, it wasn't, Dallas was not America's team. The Commanders were America's team. It was the number one franchise. Okay? And so the ability, to, the ability to be involved in, so I think this is a, uh, you know, it's, it is a labor of love. It's a, it's a, we're engaging this community. On the other hand, All right. you know, I think it is a really unique franchise, a really unique asset. And what I've learned in, you know, shepherding and stewarding sports franchises is that you give back to the community, you do the right things, you win, and kind of the economics take care of take care of themselves, and I have no reason to believe that's been any different for the commanders. Okay, so um, did you ever meet with the owner of the team, or you didn't need to do that? No, no. I um, so um, initially, um, you know, there was um, there were rumors of this uh, unnamed individual who owns a paper, and uh, I had to make sure that. Uh, this was going to be a fair process, so um, I did, uh, you know, go to London a few times, and I did okay. uh, meet with uh, the the owner. And uh, had an uplifting experience. <laughs> it was a very cordial meeting. I got to meet. Uh, okay. All right. So you had the uh, meeting. Yeah, I got to meet Dan, and it was a very, you know, they were, um, you know, I, I met them in the context of of this transaction, and it was a totally cordial, nice meeting. I mean, they were a tough counterparty. Obviously, they did what they should do, which is try to, you know, push the price up as much as possible. And that's what sellers do, right? So when the deal was over, and whenever a deal is over, you always find out who you're really competing with and whether they were really there or not. Do you think that you've now learned, was there somebody close to six <clears throat> billion dollars or you don't know still? No, so I think that um, we found ourselves in a unique position when Mitch and I came together um, in terms of, you know, the ability, right, when you're, uh, when you're um, the, the, the size of the equity check for an NFL club is enormous, right? There are very few people who can do it. And, and so we felt that the names that were being bandied about, with the exception of the name that, uh, you know, that I've, been, I've not been mentioning, um, we, we thought we had a competitive advantage where we could, um, you know, we could um, raise capital. And so the fact that we had run sports franchises, we had other partners, those sports franchises had done well. We'd engage with uh, Philly, we engaged with Newark, we engaged with South London and in the Premier League, and that there were partners that would vouch for us, plus Mitch's, um, Mitch's you know, involvement in the city and his, uh, the size of his commitment and, uh, and, and all the partners that came together, Mark's local connections, we, that gave us an opportunity to attract, you know, people in this room. And, you know, it's not just Mitch and I. We have 20 amazing partners, like Magic Johnson today was uh, at... How did, uh, how did Magic Johnson get into the... Mitch, how did Magic Johnson get to be part of this? You just call Magic Johnson up and say, hey, you would like to own a piece of a football team? Or He did. Oh, you did. Uh, you did. I had no Magic uh, through sports, and... Um, he, um, you know, he wanted to own an NFL team, and um, he loves Washington, and, um, you know, he played the sport, you know, before he became a pro basketball player, and, um, and he's been successful and lucky and could, uh, and, and could make a financial commitment, and so he was an ideal partner for us, and then there's all kinds of other people that are, you know, tremendously successful in business, many of whom don't want their names out there, uh, but who you know got involved. And the other groups that were competing with us, we didn't think that they had the ability to bring this kind of group together. And I think the fact that Mitch and I uh, were, were born in Washington, grew up here, knew the city, that really made a difference so, uh, to everyone. Uh, there was one group from Texas that had a very real bid on the table. Can you imagine? If a Texan bought this team, what that would feel like right now? We couldn't let that happen. So um, 
Mitch, um, <laughs> you went to the, I think Magic Johnson was with both of you today. Did he go to the practice facilities or was that today? Yeah, today he went to the, um, the training, uh, training camp. Facility. And look, he, he, he spoke to the team and, um, you know, there's not a lot of people that have won as an athlete, five NBA championships, and as an owner, five other world championships. And so his ability to you know, speak uniquely to what creates a winning franchise to people that are spending their entire lives um, tra training and getting ready for Sunday, uh, he had a unique perspective that was very appreciated in the room. And, uh, and so he's a unique partner, and he has a unique role to play with us that goes beyond sports. He's an incredibly successful business person. So will you guys go into the locker rooms after the games or before the games and say, win one for the Gipper? You're going to just going to make those kind of speeches or not? You're not going to do that? We, you know, I'm not I, a locker room guy. I think, I think that, um, you know, ultimately, right, I think that everyone has a role to play. And I think your role um, as a coach is to do that. Um, your role as a, an owner, right, is to um, be a responsible steward, be an example, do the right thing, um, engage with the city, uh, set up the um, fan experience in a way that's super positive, give back to people in need, help change communities, and then ultimately win football games, right? And I should have said that first, but like your, your, your job is to win football games. So, and if you go into a locker room and try to, uh, it, it's hard for either of us to go into a locker room and um, <clears throat> say something to a 20 to 30 year old person who's a professional player and who's spent their whole life being the best at their sport, other than in, in a way that's uh, applying it to our own lives as business people and that they get. But you know, usually, um, Usually that's not an effective strategy, and so you let the, uh, the coach and the other players speak in the locker room. So, hey, David, Josh and I are very aligned on this concept, and one of the great secrets of Danaher is we don't run the day-to-day. -day. We have great leaders running the day-to-day -day who know so much more about science and technology than we do, but it, our job is to hire the right people to go out there day in and day out and do the great job. And we're hoping that that team is in place. Now, now will you guys be at every home game? We'll be at every home game. And, we'll, and you know, look, honestly, I'm, uh, we'll be at every home game, and you're gonna see a lot of me. Yeah. You might. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, now, uh, both of you guys are business people, so you don't invest money just to lose money. You presume that you're gonna make money on this eventually, but you're planning to hold on for ever, or? 10 years, or how much long do you want to hold on to this investment? Look, I can't speak for Mitch, but to speak for myself, um, I believe that um, sports, uh, the sort of globalization of media uh, is an intergenerational asset. I think that it's um, something that appreciates. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not about, you know, current. It's about building an amazing franchise. An amazing franchise is something uh, it's sort of a business, but it's also sort of a piece of art and something that people can appreciate and love. And so if you do that and if you do the right thing, it appreciates. And sports teams have appreciated uh, historically, and I expect they will continue to do that. And, and so I, for, speaking for myself, um, I don't expect you know, us to sell the franchise. I expect to be here for an awfully long time, and it's so good to be back. So Mitch, um, the NFL, um, has had problems over the years with concussions. Now, a lawsuit was settled, but still concussions can occur. Um, are you, you played football. I mean, how serious a problem is it today? Is the equipment not much better? Or is it the rules such that you can't um, hit people quite as hard if you're a quarterback or something? The, the technology continues to evolve. If you were at training camp, you would see these incredible helmets that these guys are wearing to protect them just from the day-to-day uh, contact during training camp itself. The technology in the helmets is better. The protocol coming off the sidelines when somebody's been whacked pretty good is much different than it used to be. Right. In the old days, you know, you come out for a play and the coach would say, now get back in there and do it. And y you can't do that anymore. The, the name of the game is safety first. You've seen what's happened with kickoffs. It's right. just different. And I suspect that things will continue to evolve in a way that's user-friendly for, for concussion protocol. Right. 
So Mitch, uh, for the last 20 years, the team didn't get very far in the playoffs. Um, but do you think you can win a Super Bowl this year or next year? How many years will it, will it take? Another two or three years? So, so what I like to say is we're all Super Bowl champions at training camp. Okay. And now, now the real world start, starts. Listen, let's, let's be realistic. Do we have a great quarterback? We just don't know right now. We, ha we have a great kid who wants to learn and he wants to play hard and he has great intentions, but he's had one NFL start. Let's see. I mean, I could write the script that we go to the Super Bowl this year, or I could write the script that it's a tough season, but we're going we're gonna to get a chance to watch and learn and, and make adjustments over the course of time, but we hope we've got our guy. Yeah, let me, let me say that. I think that um, neither of us are doing this. Uh, to do anything other than like compete for championships and so it's easy to say that um, there are 32 other teams that want to do it um, it starts with uh, I think the commander they've had a great training cramp um, Sam has showed very well uh, the draft picks have showed well uh, the team is very excited um, you know the team obviously perform just missed the playoffs but predicting uh, and and our job is to build a culture Right. Uh, a winning culture and you know ultimately it but it's very hard to put a time frame on when all that happens and what you can do uh, when you can do as an owner is you can set up uh, you know an opportunity to win ultimately the players win they win on the field uh, and you have to you know continue to push the organization to create edges again uh, uh, versus 32 other 31 other teams and so we're totally focused on it. Like when it happens, it's hard to know. All right. So sometimes people say that the food at some of the stadiums games, you know, it's not the healthiest <laughs> or something. Um, they have unhealthy food. Some people say. So are you guys going to have healthier food at the stadium? <laughs> we're we're, we're, we're look like things don't change every night. But I will tell you, we're meeting every night. Uh, in fact, I have uh, on my email looking at Jason. I have on my email uh, a proposal of how we upgrade um, and invest in uh, new ovens, new pantries, new dishes, uh, and um, that's a very strategic thing. If someone's coming into your house, you don't want to serve them bad food, you want to serve them good food. So we're working with our, our partner to revamp all that and to uh, invest in okay. the fan experience. But, uh, you know, truthfully, uh, when I was when, when I first uh, bought uh, the Sixers, I put out crudite and like sushi and no one ate it. Uh, everyone ate uh, cheeseburgers and hot dogs and hoagies. And so like, I think you're only gonna get so far in a sporting event uh, putting out the crudite. Like the fans are gonna wanna eat okay. like what they eat. And so you just have to make it very high quality. There'll be a little bit of veg veggies here and there for, for those of us that I uh, want to watch our waistline, but by and large, you know, you'll see a lot of uh, hopefully better hot dogs, hamburgers, cheeseburgers. So I don't want to re reduce your investment, but some people, <laughs> I think there was an article in the Post the, today or yesterday saying maybe you should reduce some of the parking price for, at the stadium. Have you thought about that yet? We're, we're trying to be generous. Uh, stay tuned. Well, you okay. know, I don't want to... All right, Mitch, what about the name? Some people say the commander's name is maybe not as good as you might want. Have you decided to keep the name, or you haven't decided yet? So, so we, could take, we could take the easy way out and say, well, we're not focused on that right now. What I can tell you is we're, we're not focused on the previous name. That, that ship, ship has sailed. And we're not going to relitigate the past. We're about the future. And we're about building the future and not having a divisive you know, culture that we're, we're engaged in. We're going to look at everything come the end of the year and think about a lot of different things and do a lot of testing and see what people think, and we'll learn. And the beauty is, is we, we have the time to look at all this stuff intelligently and make okay. fan-based decisions. So both of you have very big businesses you're running, and you've got a couple of sports teams, and you've got a gigantic business and an art museum and so forth. How do you have the time to focus on the football team? Look, I think that, I mean, obviously, whatever else we're doing, um, everyone's going to remember, um, you know, the, for what we do here. This is bigger than, you know, Mitch has done an amazing job at Donner. It's an incredible company. I mean, obviously, Apollo, I'm so proud of that chapter in my life. 
I have a new business. So, um, but when we took on this responsibility, all of us, like, you know, I spoke to Marjorie and my family, I'm sure Mitch did, and we said, and I said, look, um, I was working about 60 hours a week. And I said, I think I'm gonna be working 90 hours a week. Uh, and so like the other work doesn't go away. We can't trick that either, but um, you know, this has got to be, you know, we, we took on a responsibility to everyone in this room uh, when we did this. And so we're all in on making this successful and um, it's going to be a bit of hard work for a while, but ultimately, right, what you do is you, you, you set a culture, you set a team, you, and, and, and you, right. you know, ultimately can back off. But right now we're going to be present. Well, your wife is here. Was she happy when you said you're going to be away more or was she sad? <laughs> She's like, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, like my, like my, my wife wants me to, uh, I'm very lucky. Marjorie, please stand up. You know, yeah, I'm, I couldn't have done. So, yeah. Uh, I couldn't have done half the things in my life. Uh, right. that I've done without the support of my wife. So she wanted me to be happy. And some people like golf, some people like the tennis. I, I like working, and so she said, go for it. Okay, so you've been married how many years? <laughs> been married 28 wonderful years. Okay. Uh, Mitch, let me ask you this. Um, you're a former football player. You say you have some knowledge of the sport. Do you think you could give any tips to any of the coaches or, any, or anything? No, not really. No, I, um, I learned a lesson the hard way. I played in a Maryland State All-Star game competing for one of the last two scholarships to the University of Maryland. There were four of us competing, and I was up against a guy blocking me. I was a linebacker. He was on a full ride to Penn State. He was 6'6", 285 pounds, and ran a 4'7", And when I came off the field that day, my dad said to me, why is your uniform dirty on the back and white on the front? I quickly learned that I better become a business builder rather than a football player. So have you ever thought how much better your life would be had you gotten that scholarship? I, I was lucky that that right. game happened. Okay. So let's talk about the, one of the teams you own, the 76ers. When you own a basket, you bought the team, I think, for, it seemed like a low price today. Was it $215 million or? $280. $280 million. Okay. So, and then you syndicated it out. And today, these teams are worth billions of dollars. Right. Did you ever anticipate the team would be worth two, three, four billion dollars when you made that investment? No, I did not. I mean, I literally, um, at that point, um, the Sixers were, um, you know, hadn't been to the playoffs since the Iverson years. Um, they had lost engagement with the city. Um, they were losing a lot of money. And so I was, like, nervous that it would go the other way. And um, the NBA was in a lockout. So they weren't playing, and it was just at the financial crisis. It just occurred. So um, I looked at it, and I said, look, this is a storied franchise. Uh, the city um, really loves sports. I was lucky enough to, um, in 1982, I was finishing up my uh, senior year, and I went to the field school. So I was going into BCC. I've got two friends in the audience that I uh, went to field, so I want to make sure I clarified that. But I was going to Leland, which is the BCC school, and my parents were smart enough to say I was hanging out with the wrestlers. Oh, okay. They said you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go. I wasn't getting good grades, so I went to the field school, and um, and ultimately um, I saw the commander. This is the first Joe Gibbs season. You know, Riggins broke away, uh, arm hanging off, and. And I got to see the ticker tape parade. I got to see Washington unite behind the commanders. It was a very racially divided city. So then I went to my freshman year at Penn, and it was uh, Dr. J, Moses Malone, Maurice Cheeks, Andrew Tony, and it was the faux, 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 Moses Malone called like a sweep in the playoffs. And the Sixers won, and I got to see that parade, and it left an indelible uh, mark on me about what sports teams can do to unite really divided cities, because both cities were divided. So at the time I bought the Sixers, I was incredibly worried about losing my shirt. But I said, look, this is like a civic duty. This is like charity, and I'm going to do it. And you know, it's worked out, obviously, you know, wild, beyond my wildest dreams. When you bought the team, you said you were going to go to every home game. Did you ever regret saying that? I don't think I said I was going to every home basketball game. <laughs> oh, I thought you did. No. Yeah, there's only. There's only uh, eight or nine home games here. I, I may regret it, but I'm going to do it. No, I mean, I, every, every game, when you bought the 76ers, I thought you said you, you, bought, you, went, you were going to go every, every game. I don't think no? I said You didn't that. say that? Okay. I hope not. All right. So, Mitch, um, 
let me ask you, what would you like the fans of Washington, D.C. area to do? What, how can they help you other than buying tickets? Is that what they can do the most? Well, look, you know, but Mitch and I have been surprised because we've talked to a lot of players, and the players would say to us, um, sometimes we don't feel like we're at home when we're in our stadium. Uh, we feel like we're away because there are other fans from other, I'm not, other cities, one of which I'm not going to mention, and they're invading our stadium, and, they, and, they, and they're so appreciative of Washington showing up, and they're so appreciative of all the support that everyone out there is, is giving uh, them and us. And so I think it is a little bit of like, it takes a village. You'd be surprised. Like, it really matters. Um, and we want to get you back in our collective house. You know, we want you cheering loud for the team. We want you supporting the team. We want you supporting the players. Uh, and, and that's how you all can help, uh, whether it's sponsorships, suites, whatever you can do. And uh, we look forward to you know, having a great time on Sunday and, uh, right. and, and celebrating, uh, celebrating a win. So Mitch, if somebody says, okay, I've listened to what you both said, I'd like to buy a season ticket. How much does it cost to buy a season ticket? It depends on what season ticket you buy, but. Oh. But is it? It's 30. It, 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 $35 to, uh, for a, a game day ticket to $350 for a club seat, something okay. in that zip code. But, I, but you what, could spend more for what, The frustrating thing, <laughs> the frustrating thing to the players, let's just set the stage. Training camp 2022, opening day, 20 fan show. Jason and his team did a remarkable job getting the stadium ready between our signing and closing of the deal. But 2023, 3,500 people showed for training camp on opening day. And the final day of training camp, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, 16,000 plus showed up for training camp. Thank you, Washington. So oh, um. it, it's, it's amazing. But, but, but we need help. Now, the beautiful thing about the sellout for the Arizona Cardinals game is Arizona doesn't travel. There's going to be close to 60,000 fans that are rooting for one team. These players have never seen that. That could be worth a victory or two to us at home this year, where our home record in years past was generally worse at home than it was on the road. So, so we need everybody to step up and help. And our commitment in return is we'll continue to reinvest in the franchise. God knows we have incredible amount of money that has to be spent to upgrade the whole experience. You, you're going to come this weekend. You're going to see what Marky Mark Ein did, you know, here. Um, right. So if with, we don't with, like it, we, with, we, we don't like it, we can blame him? Or, no, no. Well, yeah. So, uh, any any a hot dog or hamburger complaints right there. Yeah, so, right there. Um, all right, but so, you're going to see some stuff this year that's going to be very yeah. different that took place between the last preseason game and the opener on Sunday. When, uh, when did the league approve your deal? The owners, like, was it three quarters of the owners have to approve it or something like that? Yeah. So uh, what, when you get in, you meet with the owners, what was it like to meet with them the first time? Did they say, thanks for paying such a high price now, my franchise is worth more? Or? Pretty much. No, they, they, they <laughs> probably were thinking it. They were, they were kind of okay. not saying that. No. Oh. They, look, they, look, obviously, um, we were approved 32-0. Um, I think that it was, um, they were excited to turn the page uh, and, um, you know, welcome a new ownership group that had uh, local roots, that had Washington roots, that was well-financed, that, you know, you know, that, you know, you know, that had diversity, uh, that had, uh, you know, a group of people that were committed to helping others. And so, you know, the, and some of us had sports experience, and so the owners, you know, voted 32-0. Uh, and, uh, you know, and obviously, you know, if you're in the NFC East, right, we're coming back, right? So in some sense, uh, it might have been easier for some people to vote against us, but none of them did it, and I'm very appreciative of how we were treated. I mean, it's a little bit of a scary process. You go in, and... There's a big room, and uh, and you know you're asked to say a few words, and then they kind of like you know tell you to leave, and you don't know what's going on. So that was so, a uh, life experience. But tell me, what is it like to write a check for six billion dollars? I've never. It, it, it's that. terrible. So when you sent the check, did somebody that received it thank you or call you? No, no, no one. So uh, the day of the press conference, 
I'm reviewing this thing and I'm like, and you know, so a lot of it was from me, unfortunately, and my wife and my family. And I'm selling treasuries and I'm like, this is awful. But, uh, you know, obviously it, it, it was a, it's a life experience both to, ha and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to do it and to have, you know, been oh. smiled on, but also, but that was not the funnest part of the day. So, I'll Mitch, tell you that. When you went in the locker room, after you went to meet with the players, after you were approved as the owners, you could then legally meet with the players, right? When you two both met with the players the first time, I guess, in training, what was it like? Did the players stand up and cheer? Or? We had lunches. Josh and I went to lunches together, and we would meet 10 to 12 players uh, during the course of that lunch, and we had a round table to get to know each other. And we wanted to learn about their lives and who they were and the way they were thinking. And, what they were experiencing as part of this new regime and what it was like in the old days and what we could do to improve things for them. I mean, they all talk in the league. And, you know, you can look at the statistics and see where our training camp compared to other training camps, our stadium compared to other stadiums. And they were very candid with us about a lot of things, and we're listening and learning. Now, are the training camp and the uh, stadium, they're not linked. You, they're separate facilities, so you could change the training camp and move it elsewhere if you wanted to, or the yes. same with the stadium? Yes. And do you have a preference for, ask this again, D.C., Maryland, or Virginia? I'm, I'm going to answer this. We're looking. Yeah. We're, we're very, we're very um, excited to be welcomed by all three uh, jurisdiction and, and, you know, we're looking forward to engaging in the process. We actually, you know, hired, uh, you know, we have the beginnings of a real estate team to help us with all this. We're very serious, uh, someone who's built stadiums in the past and, um, you know, obviously um, we're blessed to be, you know, welcomed by all three jurisdictions and so we're going to engage quickly uh, because, uh, you know, we appreciate that the, the sooner we get started, the sooner, sooner the Okay. team will have a new home. So the NFL teams have gone up in value dramatically in the last 25 years or so, in part because television contracts. I think, as you pointed out, of the, what, 50 most watched television shows in history, something like 45 are NFL games. But can that continue, really, at that uh, accelerated pace? And do you expect some leveling off or that or a decline as people are watching less television or something? Or So, so live, I don't. I mean, I really don't. You know, live events. So look at the Taylor Swift concert, look at, um, you know, Barbie, look at uh, Beyonce. Uh, you're seeing like billion dollar tours, like li live experiences where everyone comes together are, are unique. And, you know, the NFL is dominant. So and, and, I, and, I don't, and I think that it'll continue to uh, be the dominant force in American television. Uh, uh, networks and uh, cable companies and even tech companies uh, need the subscribers, they need the eyeballs watching it, and so it's unique. So sometimes I've seen some owners stand on the sidelines during the games. Are you going to be doing that? Do you stand on the sidelines cheering them on, or are you going to be up in... With the... we look, both, you know, we, like both of us like to engage in some way. I think we're going to do it. We're going to have to sort out how do we engage in a way that's respectful to what's going on, that keeps the player. This is all, this is not about us. This is about uh, the commanders winning football games. And so like our engagement will be, you know, a function of what makes sense. I don't think uh, necessarily that, so there'll be, you, we may appear on a sideline here or there, but I think that to a large extent, you know, the, uh, you, want, you want to keep everyone focused on what they're doing. You don't want to cause a commotion, but there'll be times Right. where we think it's appropriate. So um, in the old, old days when I was growing up, baseball teams I know and football teams, the players would go on the road and they would have a roommate because they would share a room. And, but in recent days, I think, don't players all get their own room on the road? Or is that how, do you have roommates still? It, 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 it varies by, by team uh, and it varies by player. Generally, you get your own room. And you have a plane you charter to take them everywhere and you go on that they, plane or you go on a separate? You can do whatever you want. When you're the owner, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, you can go on the plane. I mean, it sounds very glamorous. It's really not that glamorous. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's a packed plane. Um, and I don't, you know, I've not been on the charter plane with the cameras. I know uh, in the NBA, it's a Delta plane for the most part and, uh, or another airline. And they take out seats uh, so that the players have okay. leg room. 
So but it's not, it's like being on a commercial flight with it's packed. I mean, it's not. Now, in the, in the NBA, yeah. the, most players in the NBA have not finished college. Uh, my impression is they basically have one or two years of college <coughs> and they go to that. And right. that's the standard NBA. In the NFL, I don't really know. Do most of these people have college degrees now or do they get them afterwards? I just don't know. I, I believe that most people do not finish their degrees afterwards and that uh, most people, it's very, it's similar. I mean, what's changing in the NCAA, obviously, is that un under certain circumstances, uh, players now own, uh, the, the colleges can pay players for their likeness, for their rights. And so you're now seeing situations where, you know, good players have uh, more uh, incentive to stay in college. But up until now, that hasn't been the case. And so if you're a player, right, um, and you get hurt in college, and, and, the, and the NFL or the NBA is your way of making money, what you, you're not going to take that risk. You're going to try and come out earlier and get paid. And so I think now for the very big players, some of them are staying in school. And, but I think for the most part, no, they don't finish college. And like the, part of what we're trying to do is figure out how to get them. The average NFL player plays for four years before he or she is injured or? Less, 3.6. 3.6. I heard the stat today, okay. yep. So um, some teams have programs to educate their players about how to not lose their money. And I, you guys could say, just invest with me, invest in Danaher, they would do pretty well, or invest with your firm. Yeah. Um, you guys gonna educate your players on how to yeah. invest better? <laughs> so, so all the players, so, so obviously, look, financial literacy and helping players save for the future when they have a very uh, short, in fact, we talked about it today uh, with the players uh, during Magic Stock, because Magic is an incredibly successful player that's also, and we were figuring out how to start you know, a process of making uh, us available to the players. But to a large extent, you'd be surprised that the players um, have agents uh, and other people around them. There's CBA rules. You got to be pretty careful with um, getting a, having a player invest in your, in fact, um, I know in the NBA it's prohibited. So what I try to do is educate the players on, be an advisor, but not for myself. Okay. So, Not for myself. Now, both, when both of you were in high school, it probably wasn't predicted by your parents or maybe by you that you'd become financially successful beyond anybody's dreams or you'd own these teams. What do you think led you to be so successful? Is it hard work, being smarter, um, being a better athlete? What, what is it that you had that enabled you to get to where you are? What would you recommend to some young person watching this that he or she should do to get to where you are. And same with Mitch. Well, look, what I would always say is that, uh, you know, I was never the tallest, uh, I was never the smartest, I was never the strongest, but I, I left it all out there. I, I sort of focused, it was tenacity and grit. Like, wrestling actually for me was an incredible learning experience. There's nothing like, when you didn't lift, when you didn't run, when you didn't train, where you weren't fully prepared, um, you got physically dominated by another person and there was no one there. It was just you and that person. And so it, tr it really forced me to like apply sports to life, right? And so what I always say to young people is, A, like pick what you love because you, if you don't love it, you're not going to do it. And then, uh, and then throw everything you have at it. And generally, um, if you're, you know, obviously, you know, you, you're never going to, you know, achieving great levels, being an NFL player, right? You need to have some inherent talent, but um, I think that grit and determination, tenacity overcomes a lot, and I think that's my, that's what I would at least say about it. What would you? So, we all work hard. Everybody in this room works hard. And we all get lucky breaks along the way, and I often like to say, what's our return on luck? And you got to seize the moment when the return on luck opportunity is, is in front of you, and most people don't take it. They're, they're at certain areas of their career where they're not prepared to take risk. They don't look at the big trends that are, that are going on. I, I, I often say we grew up in a time where you could borrow money against assets. This is our going back to our leverage buyout days in the early 80s. Um, that was a secular trend that we were very lucky to be part of. But today, with computing power the way it is, you can start something in your garage with an iPhone today and, and make a hell of a new product and, and create a billion-dollar business overnight. So there are always opportunities that people 
have put in front of them. You just have to seize the return on luck opportunity. I agree. I think it's dream. I would say I 100% agree with you. Dream big. Dream big. Enter the arena. Now, Don't be afraid. A couple of years ago, I was the chairman of the board of Duke University, and I said to Coach K, why can't you recruit a few Jewish basketball players? And he said, David, I want to win. And so um, how many Jewish football players are there in the NFL? Not a lot. So I'm going to use an analogy. Did anybody ever see the movie Airplane? Right. Yes. So the stewardess is walking down the aisle. Would you like some nice light reading? Famous Jewish athletes? You know, it's, there are not a lot of famous Jewish athletes. I'm not quite sure why. Okay, so um, let me ask you about the coaching team. You inherited the coaching team that, you know, Coach Rivera, who was there, he's been there a couple years. So um, do you say to him, look, I'll give you one year, give you two years. How long before you say, yes, he's the right person or no, he's not the right person? Yeah, look, I think um, Coach Rivera, uh, I've, I've, been, I've really enjoyed getting to know Coach Rivera. He is a good man. Um, he's done a great job. Um, in terms of the, where the team is relative to where it was when he got here and relative to a lot of the distraction that was going on. Um, he's got a very capable front office. Um, you know, having Eric there, I think, I'm very hopeful for. And so what I've said is that, you know, we're all, we're getting up to speed. Uh, we want to hear how you think. Um, we want to, you know, learn. We want to learn how you make decisions. And, it's going really well. Um, you know, I, I don't find like putting tremendous pressure on someone like, you know, everyone who coaches uh, an NFL team or an NBA team and, 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 and us as owners, we all realize, right? I mean, we're, I mean, we completely appreciate, um, you know, the um, support we've gotten in Washington, but we all realize that, and he realizes that, we all realize that ultimately we have to deliver wins on the field. And so that you don't really need to say anything it's just out there, and I think that, um, um, and and so I think that all of us, this is, you know, but so far so good. So are you guys going to be in the draft room when you're drafting players? Are you going to say pick this one or that one, or you're not going to do that? I think you look. I think when you, I'm in the draft room in, in the NBA, and I would expect to be in the draft room in uh, the NFL. I, I'd say that you want to understand the process, you want to understand the key decisions. You're not you're not picking players. Uh, you know, you're allowing for that process to operate. In fact, when we uh, went to 53, um, I specifically stayed, I, I, I said, I asked to be briefed on okay. some of the harder decisions, but I didn't want to be in the room because I didn't want their process to, to be altered. And so you pick your moments and actually I'll, I would say that I don't know. I mean, I think you'll have to see, you know, where you are at that point, but I think you want, you want the professionals picking players. You don't want to be picking draft picks. I mean, if you're signing a massive deal, you know, of course, you're going to want to know about that and understand that a bit more. But you're not. You're not going to be. Did the owner player. does the owner have to approve each of the major trades, or do you have to do that? Yes. And you yeah, do. I, I think the key thing that Josh and I are going to think about is making sure that we don't make short-term decisions that mortgage the future. We've got to build this block by block from the bottom up the right way, and right. it's going to take some time. All right. So, now you have a number of investors. I think you've just said you've got 20 or so. 20. Like 20. Yep. Okay, so do you have to call them up every week and say, here's how it's going, or you said, I'll let you give you an annual letter? And, and they, they call you. Uh, okay, all right. No, some of it, listen, and we have incredible investors. I mean, and again, I don't know whose name I'm supposed to mention, so I'm not going to mention any names, but, uh, you know, some of the biggest uh, business leaders and philanthropists in the whole country. And, um, and I would say that, um, you know, when we did this, um, the paradigm we set out was, um, you know, we're going to run this in a professional way. We are going to have board meetings. Um, I expect to lean on the investor group for um, community engagement. Um, I expect to lean on business acumen um, and um, support, uh, financial support, investment. We're going to have to, like I said, we're going to attempt to, you know, build a stadium that's going to require incremental capital. But um, you don't you don't run um, a sports team you know by committee you don't you know obviously I'm accountable to the city I'm accountable to our investors I appreciate that uh, and so they have the right to know what's going on but on a day to day basis okay. you know they're not in the they're not in the mix and the problem is the media is so immediate it's a lot like politics you can't have uh, a vote you know when the coach wants to cut to 53 the coach needs to be able to cut to 53. I haven't been to a 
football game here in probably 20 years, but I'm coming on Sunday, thanks to the invitation of the ownership group. And uh, how long is it going to take me to drive from my home in Bethesda to the field? Is that like a two-hour drive or an hour and a half? I don't know. Defer to Mitch. The, the commute isn't the best, uh, and we would encourage you to leave early. Leave early. <laughs> okay. okay. There'll be some good festivities beforehand. All right. Good tailgating. Okay. David, I expect you to be, the, how many beers are you going to chug <laughs> in the parking lot? Oh, uh, I don't think of so, but okay. So, um, listen, uh, I want to just thank both of you for stepping up to the plate and, and um, you know, rescuing the franchise. Um, it wasn't the cheapest purchase price you could have engaged in. So, um, obviously, it's a lot of money. To, you both you guys worked hard to make this money, and your investors did, and you've put it on the line here, and so hopefully it'll work out for you, but also for the community. And so on behalf of everybody in the community, I'd say thank you for doing this, and I'll see you at the Super Bowl soon. Thank you, Washington. Thank you. I have a gift for you. Hold on. Okay. So, Josh, this is a map of the District of Columbia, oh, a my ancient God. map. And this, Mitch, is yours. This okay. one's yours, one for you, one for you. There we are. Hold up. Okay. So how many people are going to the game on Sunday? Okay. Hey. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.